there, Lindsay here, the frugal crafter. Don't mind my coat. I just had this laying on the radiator and so it's like super cozy and comfy. So I'm like, oh, I'm not taking that off. It's too chilly down here. Um, today I wanted to answer a question that was um, sent in by a few different viewers and there was a couple different contexts for the question. So I thought it'd be fun to um, kind of go into it a little bit. And um, I get asked a lot because I did the KonMari method about three years ago in my entire house and my craft room and I get asked a lot about how things have held up if I've uh, if I have stayed decluttered or if I have gone back to my you know hoarder messy slobby ways and I have to say that yeah I've, I've kept it up um, more things have come in more things have gone out but um, it's definitely changed the way that I shop it's changed the way that um, I look at products and um, it's given me a much better perspective over how I actually work and how I craft and and what I realistically need for supplies. So, um, and what I mean about that is like I used to teach full time and in my own studio, so I had supplies for all of that, all those classes and stuff. And I would still be in kind of the mindset when if I saw a good deal on something where I'd be like, oh, I can use that in a class. So instead of buying, you know, you know, one pair of scissors, I'd buy twenty pair if it was a good deal. Or instead of buying one pad of watercolor paper, I'd buy twenty because. Well, I can use that in a class. So I definitely, um, I definitely don't do that anymore. And I think it was because you have to confront everything you have. It really gives you a feeling of abundance versus a feeling of scarcity. And um, I think I used to have that feeling of scarcity, like, well, what if I can't get that again? What if I can't um, find a deal like that again? What if I have to pay full price? And I realized that, you know, if it's better to wait and pay full price for something that you actually need than it is to hoard a bunch of stuff that you've got a great deal on that you might never use because it's taking up space in your home and that space is valuable as well. So I definitely shifted from more of a scarcity mindset to more of a mindset of abundance. Like, no, I have plenty. I don't need to buy that. I've got plenty. If I don't have exactly what I need, I have something I can substitute. So that definitely, um, definitely helped that mindset and throughout my entire house too. So uh, we live in a small house. I never really did this square footage before but it's under a, a thousand square feet um it's got a full basement so that's why i have this large craft space um but like that the it's a ranch so the first floor is is small so it, no wonder no wonder it made such a big difference when i went through and cleared out um and i'm so glad that we did that before we put our addition up which we're, it's going up right now because um because otherwise it you know we would just filled it up you no know, you know rather than having like, oh no, it's space. We're not just doing this because we need more storage space. We actually need some more living space because, you know, the kids are all teenagers. It's like five adults and under a thousand square feet, which is um, not very American. <laughs> I mean, I'm always drawn to those tiny houses anyway, so it's not really that big of a deal for me, but definitely people are feeling a little cramped. Um, so anyway, uh, what was the other question that people have asked me about um, like uh, environmentalism and if that's changed my crafting and I have to say that I don't think it's changed that much because I've always been a very conservative person as far as like you know using my resources wisely and not wasting and trying to um, use up scraps and not throw things away and not buy things with extra excess packaging but I definitely shop less so you know like I mentioned about the scissors I'm not buying 20 pairs anymore because I found a good deal on it you know I am if I need a pair I'm buying a pair if not I'm just let, storing it at the store and leaving it for the next person. That's why I think of it as like, okay, I, I don't need this. I'm going to leave this for the next person. Before I would have been like, well, I better buy them all and then share them with my friends. And that's good, except my friends all have way too much stuff too. So, you know, I'm not really blessing somebody else. I'd probably be burdening them with all this extra stuff. I can call them. I can send them a text say, hey, do you guys need scissors? Because there's a heck of a deal over here. You know, I can do that. Um, and I definitely have a better perspective and a, and a more realistic idea of the amount of things that I need. I have more than I need. It's clear if you like uh, look around my craft room, if you watch any of my storage videos, I have a lot of stuff. Um, I wouldn't have this much if it wasn't for my business. I do have several clients from different like marker companies, different paint companies uh, that I do process videos for, that I do freelance work for, freelance illustration for, and um, I need to have their products to in order to do those videos so that um, people can see work created with their products. You know, I don't want to use just some random brand of markers when I'm doing a video for Ohuhu or Bienio or something like that. You know, they you want to see exactly how those are going to perform so you're not misled if you're going to buy something. Um, 
and as far as you know i do enjoy collecting certain things i have always enjoyed collecting rubber stamps wood mounted rubber stamps i don't unmount my rubber, my wood stamps i enjoy looking at them they take up a, a wall but to me it's like a gallery and i love seeing all those little mini works of art i can actually probably can we spin you over there so you can see that ah, can you kind of see that that big wall of stamps that goes behind that white fold-up table and <laughs> behind my red cart there. Um, I've always enjoyed that. All these binders are stamps. I like um, going through my stamps, but I don't hoard them. If I go through and see that I have like 10 cupcake stamps, I'll save, I'll, you know, I'll go through and say, okay, I'm probably never going to use the bottom, my least three, my three least favorites because they're my least favorites. I'm going to reach for these other ones first, so I will pass those along. So I do go through and I weed through, so I'm only keeping the best of my collection and not keeping stuff that's not going to get used. Because for somebody else, that might be the best cupcake stamp they have. They can use it. Um, I'd rather having it. I'd rather have it be used than just sitting in a binder. So it's kind of like how somebody might collect plates or you know depression glass or postage stamps. You know, I enjoy collecting them. I also have a bit of a problem with an excessive amount of watercolor palettes, which if you saw my watercolor palette tour, you know what I'm talking about. But again. I enjoy them and I enjoy, you know, grabbing one of those weird, you know, even if the quality is crappy sometimes, you know, there's just something fun about a specific palette that's designed for something or in a weird color family or color format. And I enjoy that and I enjoy that collection. I take care of it. And I think the difference between a collection and a hoard is how you take care of it. If it's something that you can get to, if you know you have it, if it's not just there and you forgot about it. Um, if it's not covered with dust and it's not getting spoiled or going bad or things are drying out and being ruined or, you know, it's not being cared for, then I think that's a difference. You can, you can, if you can manage your possessions and it's not a hoard, it's, I think it's more of a collection or it's more useful stuff. Um, my craft area is definitely the most cluttered part of my home, um, but I enjoy it. And I heard, I was watching an episode of Hoarders once and this, the, the, uh, psychologist, I guess, had talked about these possessions that this woman had as comfort clutter. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's what it was for me. Definitely comfort clutter. I worried about running out and not being able to afford buying it again. And even though my situation has changed since I was a starving artist, you know, 20 years ago, my mindset is still like, well, what if I run out? What if I run out? So I think doing the KonMari method helps shift that because when you have to put all of your ribbon in a pile, you're like, whoa, I'm not going to run out. In fact, I could craft for four lifetimes and never run out of ribbon. You force yourself to face that abundance and then you just get a better perspective of things. Um, and it's very difficult to, because, you know, not everybody has the same situation. And I, you know, you can't really give advice to other people on things like that because somebody might just have three rolls of ribbon, you know, and they might have, and there may be absolutely no way they can replace something that they get rid of. And that's a different situation, but they probably don't have a huge abundance of things either. So, you know, you have to do what's right for you and, um, and what meets your needs and what is best for your lifestyle. And as far as, as far as the environmentalism aspect that, um, I think a lot more people are, are aware of the packaging and the uh, the stuff that enters our craft room. I think the biggest impact that the KonMari method has had with me being more environmentally aware is just not over consuming, not over buying, uh, so that I have to end up finding a home for it or getting rid of it or, you know, I didn't have to throw away anything decent like anything usable. Um, but you know, it could definitely get to that point. If you, if you buy stuff and you don't use it and you don't care for it, it becomes part of a hoard and then you get water damage or, you know, things get dusty and faded and things like that. And it just has to be thrown away. Then yeah, that's not good for the environment. But if, you know, if you can care for it, I was able, luckily nothing was bad. I could give, you know, give things away. Um, but yeah, it just makes you aware of like not overconsumption and not overconsuming. And one thing that changed, and I always, I don't know, it's always seemed really sketchy. And it's a weird thing that, you know, is, I don't know if it's just isolated to YouTube or not, but I used to do, like I would do a haul video. Um, like if I got back from the stamp show, I want to share, share what I was, what I was, what I had picked out. And um, those videos are so popular. YouTube loves haul videos. They promote those. They make sure that if, like, if I was to post a haul video tomorrow, YouTube would make sure that all of my subscribers saw it. When I post a tutorial, only a tiny little fraction of my subscribers will get notified of that. Um, because haul videos, advertisers love haul videos. 
uh, people who watch haul videos are generally looking to buy things, so they really push those haul videos. I stopped doing haul videos, um, let's say, uh, when I did the KonMari thing because I felt like this isn't right. I shouldn't be encouraging, I shouldn't be buying like this, and I really shouldn't be encouraging people when I've found such peace by getting rid of stuff and not buying more. Um, and I think part of the reason I was doing haul videos was because it was helping my channel and helping me reach more people. And, and it got to the point where I was buying things just because I knew I could put it in a haul video. Like, I, there was a great deal on markers at AC Moore. There was like this bag, a cute bag. I really liked the bag. And it had like 24 markers in it and the little marker cases in it. And it was just, it was cute and it was on sale, like for 50 bucks or something. So, I mean, it was like you get all markers for free or get the bag for free or however you want to convince yourself to buy this thing. It was a good deal. But when I picked it up, I almost thought, I can put this in a haul video. And that was like my, that was my justification. I didn't really need those markers. I've used the bag a few times. Times, but I definitely didn't need it and if it wasn't for the fact that I could do a haul video and YouTube would promote it and I'd be able to reach more people I wouldn't have bought it so when I started noticing myself buying things just so I can show them in a haul video I'm like this is not right this is not what I'm about this is ridiculous so luckily I didn't go too far down that rabbit hole before I came to my senses but um, I always felt very icky about that and um, and I'm sure some of you guys did too I'm sure some of you guys are like what is she doing why is she encouraging us to go and buy all this stuff and, and spend money like this um, and it wasn't like extravagant it wasn't like I was spending hundreds of dollars at a whack or anything but it definitely was excessive and for me anyway um, and I you know and I clearly didn't need those things that I was buying so now if I do a haul video it's something that I've really thought over and I've it's probably not very exciting because there's not many things but like when I found all those artist photo reference books used on Amazon. I was so excited. I couldn't wait to share that because I've been looking for those books for so long. And then a bunch of them were popping up for like $5 a book. And I was like, yes, you know, so I couldn't wait to share that because it was a great deal. And it's something very useful. And I refer to those books all the time. Like, uh, you know, I'm always grabbing them off the shelf to see, you know, a certain bird or to see a certain animal or to see a texture or whatnot. And it, they're very useful. So that that's, that's probably how it's changed the most because I've always been fairly uh, environmentally conscious, trying not trying to reuse any packaging that comes in or try to buy things without packaging, try to reuse scraps. I used to, if I, um, if I had made a card or scrapbook page, I would take the scraps and if it was smaller than two by four, two inches by four inches, if it was bigger than two inches by four inches, I filed the scraps. I have a, like a hanging file folder system that's got by color all my scraps of colored paper and cardstock. So if it was smaller than two by four, I would take my paper punches and I would punch some shapes I used all the time, like photo corners or uh, buttons, things like that. And then um, then that leftover, like just the little like bits and like total scraps, I would put in bags, like gallons of block bags by color. And then when it came time to, when I had those bags full, I would do a paper making workshop at the library with the kids and um, so that's kind of how I reuse that little one. I don't go to that extreme anymore because I don't teach at the library little kids at the library that often because my kids are older so I don't have the access to children like I used to. It sounds weird doesn't it? But when my kids were little I was always volunteering in the classrooms because all the other kids I knew all their parents knew all the kids so I was always like you know working with those kids volunteering with those kids now like I'm just some you know weird artist that you probably don't want your kids around I don't know. <laughs> I don't, but I don't end up doing um, volunteering with the kids that much uh, these days. So I don't need all of that excess stuff. And that was another thing. I think when I when I did the the whole KonMari method, I had kind of hit that season of life where my kids were older. They were in junior high, and they didn't need parents volunteering at the school at that age. They had were definitely more. It was more in the academic routines now they had to hit these certain guideposts before high school and you know, there just wasn't time for arts and crafts like there was when they were younger and the kids didn't have as much interest in that either as they did when they were younger so so it definitely hit at the right time um and then I got to bless the school library the school um art teachers with the excess materials um I got to bless friends with the materials and um I got to get a hold on things gonna get a Whole, I get to grab the reins again and get in control, which was uh, really, really needed. So hopefully that's a little encouraging for you if you were considering doing the KonMari method. For me, it worked. It's not going to work for everybody. Everybody's different. That worked for me because I put all my stuff in a pile and I had to say, oh, wow, I have plenty. Because I, as someone who always felt like, I, well, I don't want to waste it. You know, I don't want to throw that away. I don't want to give it away. What if I need it? You know, I was, I'm, a, I'm a Yankee raised in New England. We were always taught to, you know, uh, 
um, use it up, wear it out, make do or do without. That's how, you know, New Englanders are raised and it's very counterintuitive to get rid of perfectly good things. So that worked for me. It might not work for you. Something else might work for you. There's so many different um, uh, methods that you can go about decluttering if you need to. You might not need to. Um, but the thing with the KonMari method, it just, it definitely helped me not over consume. You're like, I don't shop very much anymore. I never was a, I never really enjoyed shopping before, but I did enjoy, you know, looking for art supplies and whatnot. But um, I definitely don't shop much. A lot of the new stuff that I get in is from clients that I'm working with. So um, it, that's fun because it lets me try different things, but I'm always going back to my tried and true stuff I've always used because, you know, it's my favorite. If you have your favorites, why would you, you know, get the other stuff, I guess? I don't know. Uh, so some food, th food for thought. I wish you all the encouragement. If it's something you're trying to do, declutter a bit, get organized. Uh, and, you know, you might pile everything up in a pile and realize, ah, it's not so bad. I've, I'm, this is a good amount. And a good amount is different for everybody. For some people, it'll be stuff that will fit in a, in a shoebox. For other people, it could be, you know, a, a, a she shed chalk to the rafters with stuff. It, that comfortable amount is going to vary for different people. Um, and that's fine. Everybody's different. You've got to do what feel, feels comfortable for you. I uh, hope this was helpful. Um, I guess I didn't really touch on the environmentalism stuff very much because I really, I don't know, I don't really feel that qualified to, I guess. Um, you know, I'm always learning. I'm investigating mica right now to see how mica powder is and is impacting things. And the thing I have learned as I've research things, uh, supplies and ingredients and craft supplies is that the, uh, the craft market does not really influence how things are, how mica is mined, how, um, pigments are sourced. We're like a secondary or a third grade market for these products. Automotive and plastics are like the number one buyer of these and art and craft suppliers kind of get the scraps so we don't really have the power to influence like as far as like micas and things like that go cosmetics automotive plastics all of those industries are so much larger and are the ones that have the power to really change a lot of this stuff and you know craft companies are kind of just left you know we sell for what's left over uh, to use in our products because we don't have we don't have the market share that like you know, cosmetics or automotive has, so. And plastics, oh my gosh, plastics, plastic dyes. I mean, they are so much bigger than uh, than crafting, but it's definitely important that we do our best and that we try to um, use our craft responsibly. I mean, I think it's better to send a card to somebody than a text or an email if you're thinking about them. I think it makes more impact. It makes a lot of positivity and sure, you know, mailing a card through the mail, there's a carbon footprint. Using the paper, there's a carbon footprint. You know, we do it at the expense of energy and, and you know, yes, it creates some waste, but it also makes a lot of our life worthwhile when we're able to show people how we care and do nice things for people. And there's certainly much more wasteful things. Uh, I don't know. I, so I just don't feel qualified talking on the environmental aspect that much because um, if I was truly an environmentalist, I probably wouldn't be an artist or crafter because... I use stuff and you know and it's kind of non-essential for a lot of people I mean like food air shelter clothing would be the essential things and all this other stuff is non-essential however I feel like it's very essential to my quality of life and others and um I, I don't know I just I just feel like whenever you say the word environmentalism you just gotta brace yourself for the haters and the people that are well you're not environmentalist because you do this and this and this and this it's like yeah but I'm a vegan I've been a vegan for 25 years look at all the animals I haven't eaten look at all the methane I haven't helped produce um so I don't know I don't know I just don't I, I don't feel comfortable getting into that that whole that whole can of worms I guess um although I am gonna do a video about mica I'm planning on it anyways if I can if I can uh if I can get some more information on it. Um, I have been asking though, uh, companies whether their mica is eth ethically sourced and um, like Arteza says, theirs is ethically sourced and, and synthetic, so they use both. But, um, but then again, it's also, they have to rely on what they are told from who they buy from. There's so much honor system going on that it's so difficult to uh, suss out what's true and what isn't that um, the best, the best 
policies just to try not to overconsume and try to use your resources wisely, just like we were taught in Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. All the, I imagine all the Scouts were probably taught that because that's a really important thing. Um, I've rambled long enough. It's been almost 20 minutes. I hope I haven't bored you to tears. Maybe you had this on when you were washing your dishes or cleaning your floors or something and it made the time go a little faster and I hope that's the case because, you know, I always, I always love to listen to stuff like this when I'm washing dishes and, you know, just to kind of, you know, move those chores along a little faster. Um, that's all I have for today. I hope you found it helpful. Till next time, happy crafting!